Before we get started, I want to make a quick call out to anyone who loves what we do and wants to keep supporting us to please consider joining our Patreon. We are steadily building a really cool community of bookworms over on our Patreon, and every month we do an exclusive book club with our $10 patrons over Zoom, and it is a lot of fun. So, if you love what we do, and you want to show your support, and you want to join a really cool community of bookworms talking about diverse literature, please consider becoming a patron. Stephen King and I have had a little bit of a weird and rocky relationship. It began by not really beginning at all. I became a fan of Joe Hill, Stephen King's son, long before I was a fan of Stephen King himself. I started by reading his first novel, Heart Shaped Box. I thought that was a really fun, campy, unique, horror, ghost-haunting experience. I then read Horns. I read all of his books in chronological order. I haven't read his short stories. I've heard they're pretty good. Horns was great. I thought it was a really fun book. Again, Joe Hill has this kind of campy, schlocky horror going on that I really, really enjoy. Horns was fun. It wasn't horror, but it was supernatural and strange, and I enjoyed it. The film with Daniel Radcliffe is okay. And then I read Nosferatu, which I really thought was a stellar book. To this day, it's one of my favourite books to just reread and enjoy for the fun of it. Then I read The Fireman, and I didn't like that one. And I don't think he's brought out anything else since. But anyway, I know Joe Hill's books pretty well. I enjoyed some of the Lock and Key comics. I enjoyed the TV show that Netflix brought out that was based on Lock and Key. I like Joe Hill. He's great. Stephen King, on the other hand, I read Green Mile a few years ago. Thought it was all right. I read the Dark Tower books. I read the first one, The Gunslinger. It was good. Gunslinger was a lot of fun. Very strange fantasy book. Nice and short. Really enjoyed it. Second one, a little bit boring, but okay. Third one I thought was like, that was like sweet spot. Okay, I'm into this now. The third Dark Tower was great. Couldn't get through the fourth one. Too boring. Nothing happened. Put it down. Didn't pick them up again. Then I read It. It is like 1200 pages. I think to this day, It is the longest book I've ever read. And I loved it right up until the ending. If you've read It, you'll know what I'm talking about. I will not spoil it here, though it is worth googling it because content warning. It's terrifying and problematic and frightening and awful and I don't like it. Most people hate the ending of It, and I'm referring to the child half of the story. It is divided into two halves, when the protagonists are kids and when they're adults. The end of the kid half is not okay. It's not okay, I don't care what Stephen King says, he's come out and defended it. I don't care, it's not alright. The, the new film duology of It, the first one, was really, really good, and it removed that ending. Great. And then the second one was a little bit boring. But I thought It was a really fun book. It pretty much turned me into a Stephen King fan, or at least a fan of some of his works. I liked It, and it's one of the few books of such a ridiculously obtuse and gratuitous length that I actually thought was worth it, because I spent a lot of time with those characters in their little Americana community, just getting lost in that world, and I didn't really want to leave. I thought it was a very engrossing story. So it is good. And now I just read Misery. Misery is very, very different. And I think as abject horror goes, it's really great. This is an outstanding piece of horror fiction. What's it about? Misery follows the story of a writer named Paul. He's in his 40s. He is an author of silly romance novels set in Victorian England. And he hates writing them, but his fans love them. And occasionally between the books of this series, he tries to bring out more literary fiction, the kind of stuff that wins prizes but doesn't actually get read. He wants to write those novels and he's just finished one. Great. And it's called Fast Cars, which is a ridiculous name. And he's driving through Colorado, I think. He gets into a car crash and when he wakes up, He's been dragged into this woman's cabin. She lives out in the wilderness. Her name is Annie Wilkes. Very famous name in horror. I'd heard the name before. I haven't seen the film, by the way, and now I really, really want to. I've heard the film is astonishingly good. Annie Wilkes is Paul's biggest fan, and she happens to have found him. What a wonderful coincidence. She's found him, his legs are broken, he's in a bad way, she's bandaged him up, and she's nuts. She's completely mad. You can tell that this book must have been inspired by Stephen King's own reaction to his fame. 
Stephen King was getting really big at the time that he wrote this. And you can tell that he probably had some really scary letters coming through his door, and some really scary stalkers, potentially. It feels like this book is a reaction to the misery uh, that he was feeling when he was in the midst of this crazy amount of fame that he was getting. To this day, he's arguably the world's most famous author, and I feel like this book is reactionary in some way. It's really good though. The book moves very cleverly from paranoid terror to out and out horror. About the halfway point, there is a huge revelation about Annie, and from then on it twists itself from terror to horror, at least that's how I'd describe it. But in the beginning, you've got this creeping, slow dread. You get to know Paul's character. There are flashbacks to his time as a writer, his childhood. You get a little bit of information about Annie, at least what she's willing to share. And the crux of the story, because it's, it's pretty meaty for a book about a woman who's taking care of a writer who can't walk and is also crazy. It's a pretty decently length book. It's 350 pages. And you think, well, what's going to happen in this time? A lot, actually. You know, it all takes place in Annie's house and a lot happens, and this claustrophobic dread and uh, psychological creepiness, it really soaks in, and you do kind of have to put the book down occasionally to breathe, because it is quite an exhausting atmosphere that King creates in this book. He does that by drip-feeding information about Annie until the midway point where you get a big revelation that you can kind of see coming. The way that the creeping dread is carried by the story is this. She's a big fan of his writing. In his latest book, which has just come out, he has killed off his main character, Misery. Her name is Misery, and she's been his leading lady through all of these books that his fans are big fans of. <laughs> and he's killed her off, and he says, yes, the bitch is dead, I'm finally free, and he's really happy about it. But then obviously his number one fan, she reads it, and she goes, no, that's not okay, so she smashes his legs a little bit more. She's furious that he's killed off his main character, and so she traps him in her house, he's unable to walk, and she says, you are going to write a sequel that fixes this, a sequel that brings misery back to life and continues her story. Annie forces him to burn the manuscript of this literary novel that he's really proud of so that he can focus on writing a sequel, Misery's Return. He writes a draft of it and she says, yeah, it's really good, I like it, but it's not right because he cheesed how she comes back. He cheated it. It's not natural. It doesn't work. So then he has to do it again. And actually you get a really sizable chunk of misery stuff in here. You get into Paul's head by reading several full chapters of his misery novel. So you really get to know the misery characters. You get to know the characters in our main protagonist's head. And it's a, it's, you know, it's a story within a story that really gets you into Paul's head and Paul's character. Paul's a bit of an asshole. He's a bit of a narcissist. He's not a great guy, you know, he's just this kind of middle-aged, blokey, masculine guy. His narration is unlikable, and I think that that was done on purpose. It's, it's not a nice head to live in while you're reading this book. Obviously, Annie is our villain, and she is unhinged, and she is dangerous, and she's aggressive, and she does awful things, and as the book goes on, the things she does, my god, they are chilling. But Paul is still not a very likeable character. And it's amazing the difference between Paul as a character and the books that he's been writing. The characters that he has written, this commercial, romantic, Victorian, schlocky nonsense that he's been writing, is so at odds with his own personality as this kind of roguish, beer-swilling American guy. Very, very different people. And so you can see through his writing how Paul got famous, why he got famous, and also why he hates these characters. He now is a famous writer and he feels like, now, okay, I got my money, I got my fame, now I'm gonna put out books I'm actually proud of. It's a good character. Like, again, he's not likable, but he's well-written. A very, very strongly written character is Paul. You do not have to like a character to enjoy them. And I enjoyed Paul. And I enjoyed Annie. She's incredible. She's one of the great villains of horror fiction, in my opinion. I can't wait to watch the film. I really can't. Annie is terrifying, and she's terrifying in an active and a passive way. She is so frightening in her behavior, but she's also frightening in the things that she doesn't do, the things that Paul discovers, her backstory. And this isn't one of those cases where everything happens off screen either, where it's 
scary in retrospect or anything like that. It is both. You're learning about her and you're learning from her and the actions and decisions and words that she uses. And you're even learning from the environment, the house that she chooses to live in, the fact that he finds out that she's moved around a lot, what job she used to have, her family history, her choice of environment. It's all really good environmental storytelling. I was so impressed with the way that Stephen King chose to handle Annie as a character by introducing her environment, her history, passive information as well as active information. He blends the two really, really well together. This is also not a supernatural horror. Stephen King has written horror that is supernatural and horror that isn't. And It, for example, is is amazingly supernatural horror as it goes on. The killer clown and then you find out what he actually is and where he came from and it's batshit insane. This, no. And that's why this is scary. I liked the world of It, I liked the characters. I wasn't scared at any point in that book. Not at all. I was scared reading this. I was frozen, I was disgusted, and there were moments where I kind of wanted to just bleh, put it down. I couldn't keep hold of it anymore. This is a library book, I feel bad for doing that. It's wonderfully horrific because it's not supernatural, because it's grounded, because it is psychological terror. And the fact that, as I said, it morphs from terror to horror. And I cannot really qualify that, I can't really explain it because I'll be giving away the second half of the book and I won't do that. But you'll see how the gloves come off at the midway point. And even before that, the book is eerie and frightening and disturbing and it does that thing where she leaves for a little while and he tries to escape and you know it's coming. He roams around the house looking for clues and information, looking for a phone, looking for a door that he can unlock, etc. And you know, you know she's coming back, you know she'll be back soon. And although this trope has been done a million times, although perhaps this was one of the earlier books to do it because it's quite old now, it's still terrifying because Stephen King is known for being pretty good at writing tension and he pulls it off here even though it's been done a thousand times. You can hear the violin tension, that eerie screech that you always hear in horror films and horror games. You can feel it in your head while Paul is afraid and worried and trying to get back to his room and look like he never left. It's Ooh. So Annie is unhinged, Paul is unlikable and their relationship really cements this novel. It is horrifying, it is unpredictable, and it morphs as it goes. The fact that we get flashbacks and the fact that we get chapters of Paul's book, which serve as a respite, but also a view into what Annie likes and what Paul does and how he got famous, all of this really adds a lot of meat to these characters. It is not just horror, it is still a fantastic character drama. I, I would say it's pretty flawless as a horror novel goes. At 350 pages it's a really nice length and it doesn't really waste any of its time. Even in moments where it slows down or changes pace you're grateful for it because you need that. And I think that that gives it an emotional spectrum to follow which is really appreciated. Misery is a great book and I really recommend it and I can't believe I waited this long to read it. And now I'm going to go watch the film. As I said please consider joining our Patreon, we would hugely appreciate it. And as always subscribe for books.